So hello everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today on this uh, beautiful afternoon. So my name is Dana and I represent the Marine Conservation Group of the Nature Society Singapore. Next slide, please. So Nature Society Singapore is a non-government, non-profit organization, and we work to foster awareness and appreciation of nature and to advocate the conservation of these natural spaces here in Singapore. So today and tomorrow, we are having a series of young marine biologist sessions. And today we will be talking about the fascinating sea anemones. So some other activities that Nature Society does includes guided nature walks, especially once COVID is over, um, bird watching, butterfly watching, and various types of workshops. So we're very excited to be able to still hold these online talks, even though there is COVID, but it will be a really interesting event. So today, uh, this event is organized by the Marine Conservation Group, which is one of the many interest groups that Nature Society has. And this was formed to encourage the understanding and protection of marine nature in Singapore and Southeast Asia. So our activities are focused on increasing awareness and, limit and threats to the marine ecosystems. And some of these projects include the endangered species monitoring activities. So before we begin today, uh, I have a few Zoom house rules and tips that I want to share. So firstly, you will notice that uh, everyone is muted. So uh, we will stay muted for the entirety of this event. And because we have so many people here today, which is very exciting, uh, we might need you to turn off your videos because if not, there could be some lag and it might not, uh, we can't hear the panelists properly. So also, if you look at the top right-hand corner of your Zoom window, you'll see this view button. So if you click speakers view, this allows you to see one person at a time and it is that person who is speaking. So that might be helpful if you want to uh, look at the person that is speaking. Uh, at the end of the session, we will have some time for questions. So if you have any burning questions to ask the scientists or our panelists, uh, please type them in the chat box and send them to Q&A user. So if you move your cursor to the bottom bar, you will see the chat box and you can type it there. But we may not be able to answer all questions due to the time, but we will definitely try our best. And lastly, uh, this session is also recorded and would be uploaded to our YouTube channel about one week later. So now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our four young panelists. So first up, we have Kieran. Kieran, would you like to say hi? Hi. Yeah, hello. So Kieran has a love and passion for science as it allows him to learn about all kinds of animals that live on land and in the water. And he's also keen to learn more about the environment and what we can do to help protect our planet. In particular, he's fascinated by animal behavior and he enjoys exploring the wilderness, different animals and their habitat. All right, next up, we have Evans. Evans hello, here. I'm Evans and I'm happy to be here. Yes, happy to have you as well. Uh, Evans is constantly fascinated by marine animals, especially those that have the ability to regenerate parts of its body, like the sea stars. And he believes that there are many more animals with this ability that have yet to be discovered. So we're looking forward to hopefully seeing you discover that in the future, maybe? Yes, and he also finds math really interesting and enjoys singing CG5 songs. So next up, we have Justin. Justin, please say hi. Hello, thanks for having me. Hey, nice to have you here as well. Uh, Justin is a passionate Liverpool football fan who enjoys both playing and watching football. And what he finds most interesting about the marine environment is how different types of animals can interact and thrive in a wonderful complex ecosystem. And last but not least, we have Siobhan. You'd like to say hi? Hello everyone, I'm Siobhan Lee and I'm happy to be here. Yes, happy to have you as well. And Siobhan finds life underwater really fascinating and how it is so different and unique from life on land. And she's particularly intrigued by the clownfish that lives among anemones in the coral reef. And we'll hear, be hearing a lot about anemones, so I'm really excited. Uh, her favorite author is also Annette Blyton, and she also enjoys reading, writing stories, art, and even coding. And she can design and code games to play with her family. 
She also plays the piano and the violin. So welcome to all the four young panelists and we're very excited to hear from you. And we have one additional person that we really important today and that is Dr. Nicholas Yap. Nicholas, would you like to say hi? Hello, great to be here and great to see the young marine biologists. Hope you guys have fun. Let's keep learning, let's keep sharing. So back to you, Dana. Yes. So as an introduction, uh, Nicholas' research deals with putting identities and classifying pretty stinging gelatinous blobs that one might encounter in the sea or along a seashore. And these include sea anemones and jellyfishes. But because so little is known about these creatures in Singapore, so he decided to research very heavily on them. And therefore, he is a sea anemone and jellyfish taxonomist. So his work has taken him all around the world, visiting and searching for areas in far-flung places, such as Zanzibar to Pulau Ubon, and even along the Mediterranean coastlines. So over the past decade, uh, Nicholas has written several scientific publications and contributed to books that clarify identities of both sea anemones and jellyfish. And collaborating with a global team, he has even found a new sea anemone species discovered right here in Singapore. He currently works as a research fellow on St. John's Island National Marine Laboratory, where he, his work to assign and clarify identities of sea anemones and jellyfishes continue. Because after all, how can we protect what we have if we cannot identify them in the first place? So now I'll be passing the time over to Nicholas and we're very excited for this event. All right, are you guys ready? Siobhan, Kieran, Justin and uh, Anne, I'm Evans. Are you guys ready? Yes. 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 All right, here we go. Okay, let me put up the slides, a bit of fiddling around. Oh. Make sure it's the first slide. Sea anemones, they are not your enemies. They look so pretty. They look like flowers by the seashore, but yet so little is known about them. And again, I'm Nicholas, and today I'll be joined by Kieran, Evans, and Justin, and Siobhan, and we're going to share and tell you more about sea anemones. So here we go. And in case you're wondering what the sea anemone behind is, it's a giant carpet sea anemone that you can find in Singapore. It can grow as big as a coffee table, and clownfish live in it, okay? Now, here's a bit about me. Dana did most of the introduction about me. Here you can see me swimming, snorkeling in Egypt. And there I was in Africa looking at finding sea anemones. Again, uh, look at me bending down in Africa looking for sea anemones. And I don't just go to these different places to look for sea anemones. I go to different museums around the world, in Germany, in the United Kingdom, in Japan, in the US, to look at different sea anemone specimens. So I'm a taxonomist. The taxonomist is a person that identifies sea anemones, classify them. And Siobhan, you learn about classification in your science lessons, right? When you classify things, correct? Yes. Yes. All right, here we go. Now, oops. Okay, oops. Let me just go. Again, sorry about that. Now, what are sea anemones? You might find them familiar. Like Dana said, when she watched Finding Nemo, she sees sea anemones. They are the home for the Nemo fish. And what is that, that Pokemon right there? Does anyone know? Hmm? Justin? Uh, I only know the evolution is toxapex, but I forgot what the previous one is. Right. So this Mar is... A, is it Myrny? Myrny, yes. Myrny. So Myrny is actually based on the sea anemone. And for some strange reason, if you go online and Google about coral reefs, or even search about tropical places, the pictures that they use very often for coral reefs and even for tropical places are not corals, but are of sea anemone, anemones that you see here. Here is another giant carpet sea anemone that the Nemo fish likes to live in. 
Okay. Now, sea anemones, <clears throat> they are very close cousins. They're closely related to corals. You've seen corals, they're all pretty. They are very closely related to corals. In fact, they look like corals, but just that they don't have the hard skeleton that corals have. And another closely related animal to sea anemones, what do you think it is? Can anyone tell me? Panel? Yes. Yes, Evans. Jellyfish. Well done. It is a jellyfish. So the sea anemones are close cousins to corals and jellyfish. And why is that? It is because all of them can make stings in their cells. So if you look at this video, you can see some of the stings being shot up. And these stings are like needles, and that's when it injects the venom into you, and that's where it hurts. So never, ever touch a sea anemone, okay? Try not to. And if you're doing it for signs, wear gloves. You can see them shooting it out, right? Me too. Wear gloves. You wear gloves if you're collecting it for signs. But do you touch them? No. So you see the pictures and you can see how the sea anemone, the, the stings look like in the sea anemone. One of it looks like a capsule and it's, it's like a gun. When you press it, it will shoot out the spines. And the other one looks like a spring. And this is what the sea anemone use to catch food and to protect itself. Now, in Singapore, we have many, many different kinds of sea anemones that you see here, right? We have some that look like they have fat tentacles, others that look like they live in a city, some that looks like, like something out from hell, you know, and some that looks like a giant dinner plate. How many sea anemones do you think we have in Singapore? How many different types of sea anemones do you think we have in Singapore? Siobhan, will you know? Yes. How many? Mm. 27. 27. Good try. How about Justin? What about you? How many do you think we have? Mm, I'm going to say maybe 15. 15 or 50? 50. 15. 15. 27 and 15. And what about Evans? Mr. Evans, how many do we have? Maybe 20. Maybe 20. Kieran, what do you think? Uh, Oops. 15. 15. Hang on, let me just go back again. Sorry. Oh. Well, we have about 40 over different sea anemone species in Singapore. And when you think about that, Singapore is such a small island with so little beaches that's left. But yet we have 40 different species. If you think about, if you know your geography and you know about the entire North American West Coast, North America's West Coast, there's only 30 different species along that long stretch of that West Coast. And in Singapore, we have over 40. Oh my it? God. Hmm? This is this, this pretty amazing, right? So Singapore is really, really diverse. Now, I'm, I'm having a bit of a technical issue with, with my presentation right now. So sometimes it might stop because my cursor has decided to disappear for some strange reason, but bear with me. Sorry? Right, okay. Okay. Just give me a sec. Again, sorry about that. Okay, it's all right. Now, let's talk about sea anemones. And this is where I'm going to hand it over to you four folks, okay? Justin, Kieran, Siobhan, and Evans. Shall we? All right, are you ready? Yes. Yes. Okay, first question. Where in the world can you find sea anemones? Yes, Siobhan. We can find sea anemones anywhere in oceans as deep as 10,000 meters be, below the water surface uh -huh. and or at shallow coastal waters worldwide. Yes, you can find them at the deepest ocean. 
and even the shallowest ocean. This is a world map. You see, all the green dots are where you can find different sea anemones. Now, Siobhan mentioned you can find them in the deepest ocean and the shallowest seas. Where else can you find them apart from these two places? Justin? Where else can you find them? Take a look at I the map. You can find them also, um, you can find them uh, like, yeah, just now I said the coral reefs also and like the shed mm -hmm. coastlines. But then, well, actually, you can also find them like down all the way in the south. That's uh, Antarctic, right? Antarctica, isn't that amazing? We often think that sea anemones are tropical an animals, but yet they can live in icy cold waters like the Antarctic. And look at the Ar Arctic region where Greenland is, Norway. So many different species of sea anemones are there. Can you see that? Isn't that amazing? Now, okay. So when you go to the shallow shores, when you walk along the seashore, you might find sea anemones and they're just sitting there like that, right? Some of you, Justin, have you seen a sea anemone along the seashore before? Actually, no, no. not me to have seen one. Yes. Hang on. So, so when you see a sea anemone at the seashore, most of the time they'll remain like that. Okay. Do you think they can move around, Kieran? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. How do they move? How do they move around? They can stick to some type of animals. Uh, for example, the boxer crab. Yeah. Huh. And what, what? Do you see anemones for self defense? Self defense. And where, where does the crab hold the hold the anemones? On their pincers. On their pincers. Ah, yes. Sorry, my laptop decided to work again. No. Yeah. So, Kieran, what do you, can you say that again? Uh, sea anemones can move around, mm -hmm. but sometimes they can stick to some animals like boxer crabs. Mm -hmm. Because boxer crabs use sea anemones for self defense. Self defense, and how do they hold the box? Uh, the anemones they hold it in their pincers, right? So like pom poms. Yeah. So so they can move around by sticking onto another animal like that. Now, Evans, how else can they move along? How else can they move around? Excuse me. Yeah, yeah, Siobhan? They can also move around slowly by gliding on their base or going mm -hmm. on with the current. Going on with the current, they can move around by, you say, gliding on their base, right? Yes. That's actually their feet, the pedal disc. We call it the pedal disc. That's their foot, right? So they can move around by gliding on their foot. And what about you, Evans? How else can they move around? What do you think? I was going to say also by the currents. Like by the currents. Current. So what do you mean by the currents, Siobhan? Like they just follow the current, let the current take them to another place. Mm -hmm. Some of them do that. Now, let's get back to the slide. And those ways are not the only way they can move, right? Like you said, they can move around with their feet. You see the one on the, on the right crawling and the one on the left is flapping its tentacles as it swims around. You can see the one on the left. You can, if you go down to Changi Beach, you can often see this. I'll play that again. Oops, excuse me. You can play that again. So you can see it swimming around and you can see them walking around. And that's how they can occupy so many different spaces and go around the earth. All right. Now, what else do you know about sea anemones? Why are they important? What sort of services do sea anemones provide to the environment? Evans, you want to, oh, Siobhan again? They provide protection and act as homes for small shrimps and some fishes, such as the clownfish. Such as the clownfish. What else? What else do you provide? They act as home and they provide protection for other small things like fishes, like clownfish, right? What about other things? Can you think about why are sea anemones important? Maybe let Evans try. 
Will you know Evans? Um, no. No? What about you, Kieran? No. No? Justin? They also have some kind of symbiotic relationship with like algae. Yes, they do. And can you tell me more about that? Um, I th so the once again, like it's, it provides the algae with with a a, a home, <laughs> like it's kind of home. Mm -hmm. The the algae, not I'm not exactly sure what it does, like what it does for the, the anemone do. Right. So the so the algae is a bit complicated. So you're yeah, quite right, uh, Justin, in that in that it protects the algae, the algae. But the algae also, like plants, the algae also photosynthesize. They make food using the sunlight. So that food supplements the sea anemone diet, just like you taking vitamins, right? Sometimes you take vitamin tablets, sometimes you drink vitamin C. But although the sea anemones are carnivorous, they need sometimes, some, of, some of them, not all of them, need that sort of supplement. Uh, here's a fact. Not all sea anemones have zoo algae in them. Many do not have algae in them, right? Not all sea anemones have clownfish in them. Some sea anemones are actually parasites. You know what parasites are? Yeah, you'll see that in a bit, okay? Now, let me go to the slides. Okay. Uh, there you go. So yeah, so you can see some sea anemones, they're homes to clownfish. This is the giant carpet anemone that you see, the one that's as big as your coffee table. We have them in Singapore. And if you ever go out to the wild, if you ever go to the intertidal, if you see a clownfish, very often you'll see the anemone. Because in the wild, the clownfish cannot survive without the anemone. All right, if you take the anemone away, the clownfish will be eaten. Now, sea anemones are not just important for the environment. There's, they are venom. The venom that's, that can make you, you know, that hurts when they sting you. It's also used to make, make medicines, medicine to save lives. Okay? Now, yes? Any questions? No. How do they reproduce? Yes, Siobhan? The anemones can reproduce both sexually and asexually. They reproduce mm -hmm. sexually by releasing sperm and eggs through their mouth into the sea. They reproduce asexually by breaking in half or in smaller pieces, which mm -hmm. generate into polyps. Into polyps. Well done. Sounds like you did your homework. Is that right, Evans? Um, I think so. It's like it's like sea stars. It's like sea stars. So do all do all can all of them split up into two? You think? Justin, do you think all of them can split up and reproduce asexually? Or only some can do that? Mm, I think most of them because um some of them also can do the uh, so, yeah, some of them use the sexual production, and then some of them also use like they break yeah. off or they use the what a longitudinal fission, so then they like split or so. Yep, yep, you're quite right. You're quite well, well done. Now, let me show you a video of a splitting if you haven't seen that. This is a sea anemone that we find in Singapore. It goes along the seagrass. You can find them at the roots of the seagrass. And here is it splitting up. Is pulling itself apart to become two different sea anemones. Can you see that? That's pretty cool, hey? Now, if one of them, if before it splits up, it's 100 years old, how old would it be the ones after it splits up? Would it be just one year old or 100? Maybe you'd like to try that, uh, Kieran? Uh, I think it would still be 100 because it split. Yep, they are still going still to be the same body. Do you agree with that, Siobhan? Do you think? Yes. Yes. So you see, sea anemones have been around. They are, scientists think they have been around for over 425 million years. 
because they have they adopted this sort of strategic ways to reproduce. Not all C. adapters can do this. They can, not all of them can split up. Some do. Here's another one that you can find in Singapore. If you look at the picture on the left, the black and white picture, this is what happens when you cut the sea anemone up and look inside the stomach. You see these? Yeah, what are those? What are those? Those are the babies that you can see on the right. This is Anthapura Hendai. If you go to Chek Jawa, if you go to Changi Beach again, or you go to Sunai Bolo, you can see this sea anemone. And look at the foot of the sea anemone. There's a split there. And that's where all the babies come out of it. So some of the sea anemones can get pregnant. Others, like Siobhan said, will release the eggs and the sperm. You go to the water, it becomes a little planulae, and then it grows in the polyps. But some others, like this species, can protect their young. So the young can develop in their stomachs and be released when they are ready. Okay. Okay, the next question that we have. Do you think we can eat sea anemones? I see some heads nodding. Yes, Evans. Actually, I don't think so because they can sting the they have venom. Uh-huh. When they sting you, there's venom. So I don't think you can eat that. You don't think you can eat that? What about you, Siobhan? What do you think? Can you eat them? Yes, I think the sea anemones are edible. Edible. What do you think, Justin? Do you think they're edible? Mm, I think they, they are, but then it's not, not very... Um, not very tasty. Yeah, not very tasty. And also, that they're like full of water. So it's basically eating a very little uh -huh. bit of sea and anemone because the rest is just water. So it's not a very wholesome meal. Uh huh. What do you think? What, and let's hear from Kiran. What do you think, Kiran? Can you eat them? Would you like to eat them? Uh, I think they're edible as long as you remove the venomous part. Yeah, but the venomous parts are all over the body. The stings are found all over the body, by the way. Oh. Well, yeah, it's not just in the tentacles. Even the body has stings, right? Now, I, li I like to go with the saying, in your life, you can eat anything once in your lifetime. <laughs> right. So a friend of mine, she went, she went to Spain and she saw this at the cafe. And she ordered it. It looks a bit like tampura. So what you do is to go at the cafe, you pick the sea anemone that you want, and you coat it in a batter and you deep fry it like tampura, and they serve it like that. And recently, in in this same friend of mine, she went to a Spanish restaurant in Singapore. She found that they served it with pasta too. So that's really amazing. Um, well, as you know, with sea anemones, they are low in fat, but they're in they are low in fat, and you're right. There's a lot of water content, so they are low in fat, but at the same time, they have a high carbohydrate content or protein content. So, the, but they might be the next diet food if you want to eat them, if you want to lose weight, or you now hear so much about sustainable foods, sustainable foods. Sea anemones are so easy to grow and they don't need much space to grow. That might destroy the environment. So you can actually grow them in a small space and produce a lot of them for food, right? So some sea anemones can be eaten. Oh, I hear someone's mic that's, that's uh, making a lot of noise, but it's okay, let's move on. Now, what are some special sea anemone species from Singapore? Anyone? Siobhan? No, you do not know? Justin? I think like just now you said there's the, the giant carpet sea anemone. Uh -huh. um, yeah, there's quite a lot of them. So, um, not really sure the scientific names, but um, yeah, I just know that there's a lot of 
There's quite a lot, but there are a few special ones from Singapore, actually. Kiran, would you know? No. And what about, what about you, um, Evans? Would you know? Oh, I no idea. No idea. Well, I'm going to share some with you, okay? You just can do the share screen. So there are some special sea anemones from Singapore. In fact, two of them were named after Singapore because they were discovered in Singapore. But before I get to that, we get to the oldest one, Phymantus pinnulatus. Or if you Google it online, you might find you might call it the freely anemone. Uh, it was first discovered in Singapore in 1877. That's a long time ago, right? And when they discovered it back then, there was no cameras, no photographs of the anemone. So the guy is this German guy. He took it back, and the and and then the specimen looks like that. He took, took it back from Singapore, put it in a museum in Berlin. And for 150 years, no one knew how it looked like. Can you guess how it looked like? How it looks like in real life? Would anyone like to try? Evans, would you like to try? How do you think, what color do you think it is? Uh... Maybe orange. Maybe orange. Yes, some of them are a bit orangey, but not, not all of them are. Siobhan, what, what about you? What do you think their tentacles look like? Do their tentacles look like the normal sea anemone tentacles? Or do you think, looking at this, they have special tentacles? I think they have special tentacles. How do you think these special tentacles would look like? They look a bit shorter. Shorter, maybe. Justin, what about you? Do you think they, the tentacles will look shorter? <clears throat> mm, uh, I think I, I'm, I'm going to go for a bold guess. I'm going to say uh -huh. long and thin. Long and thin. Okay, what about you, Kieran? What do you think this anemone will look like? Uh, you, I think the picture is white, so it might be some kind of, some other color that wore off when it was taken. Well, well said, okay. Yep, yep. So very often when scientists like us, when we collect specimens, it's important that we have to take good photographs because when you put it in the special chemicals, the colors will go off, well done. Now, for 150 years, no one knew how it looked like. And when I went over to Berlin to look at it, the specimen was, was quite damaged actually. But eventually with a team of other scientists, we managed to figure out how it looks like. It looks like that. Isn't it pretty? And look at the tentacles. It looks like a Christmas tree. It looks like leaves. It looks, it looks like leaves. Yes, yes. It's quite a big anemone. We call it Phymantus pinnulatus. Pinnulatus, the name pinnulatus means wings. So the tentacle looks like you've got wings, right? Right? Now, so this is one of the earliest anemone that was discovered from Singapore. All right, sorry. So for apart from the four, four panelists, um, for the rest of the audience, can you please turn off your mic? Because there's a bit of um, noise going about. Thank you so much. Apart from the four panelists, so Kieran, Justin, Evans, and Siobhan, you don't have to turn off your mic. But if the rest of you do, I'll strongly appreciate that. Thank you so much. OK. Now, these are other two special sea anemones from Singapore. And they are named after Singapore. Oops. Okay, the one on the, the, one on the left, we call it Pericondylectus singaporensis. You can find them at Lazarus Island. They only come out at night. As with Sinpicha tamasic. It was recently discovered and you can find them in Changi. Seen picture tamasic is the one that's a parasite. Where there's a baby little anemone, it's a paras it, will, it will swim towards a jellyfish and be a parasite on the jellyfish. And when it grows up, it will detach itself from the jellyfish and burrow into the shore. Yes, Evans. Which is the one that you discovered? Uh, seen picture tamasic. We oh. discovered, yeah. So it took us a long time to look for it. 
how it began was when one of my close colleagues, Bia Tan and the team, because they keep going out to the shores, then you're like, eh, this one looks different. So they took it back and with a team of scientists, we figured out that it was actually different. We tried to collect it. It took us over two years. We keep going back to Changi to try to collect it, to try to find it. But it, this anemone is so rare. It, over the two years, it took us, we only managed to find, find seven of them. And this is terrible because, because if you read the news recently, you've probably seen this, right? You remember this? This is where we found that special anemone, seen Picha Tamasic at, the Chang at Changi Beach. And it's so rare if hordes of people are going out to dig the shore like that. Probably now it's, it's gone. It might be extinct, I don't know. I, I have not seen it since, which is a real shame, right? So whatever you do, observe. If, if you want to go to the shore, observe nature, but don't touch it unless you have reasons to, good reasons to, maybe for science or for your work, okay? So those two are really special sea anemones from Singapore, Pericondylectus singaporensis and Sienpitia tamasic. And look at its beautiful orange body. Now, so that brings us about to the end of the session. Is there more, Lisa? Is there more? No. Okay. I think there's a Q&A. Yeah, there's a Q&A, sure. But before that, um, let me share the rest of my slides, okay? So, in Singapore, like I said, we have many different types of sea anemones, and these are the special ones that we have. There are many, many others that over the years we have found but have not put an identity at it. We still do not know what they are. Some of them, I, we, we do know, have special symbiotic relationships with other animals. But if we do not know what they are, how can we protect them? Others, like the one on the top right, when you touch it, it can give you a painful sting. If we do not know what they are, how can we protect ourselves from touching the anemone when we go swimming? Or avoiding it, right? So it's really, really important to know what animals are there out there. It's really, really important to put an identity on it. So how can we identify them? And how would you identify CNMEs? Evan, how would you identify them? What would you use? Google and maybe how they look look and type their find their characteristics and see if there are any other species with the same characteristics okay. uh-huh what sort of characteristics are you thinking of kiran what sort of characteristics do you think they might use to identify the cnme uh color or if mm -hmm. they can move color and if they can move well done uh whether they can their behavior wasn't used in the past, but now more and more scientists are using their behavior. And Siobhan, what else do you think can use apart from the color and their behavior? How they look and maybe... Mm -hmm. How they look, inside or outside? Inside the body or outside? Their outer appearance? Both. Which would you... Outside. Both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what else? Justin, what else would you use? Uh, maybe uh, where you can find them. Where you can find them, their habitat data, the habitat data. And with new technologies, what else can you use? Can you make a guess? Diet. Diet, maybe. Now, these days, apart from everything that you said, 
from habitat, behavior, looking inside them, outside them. We also look at museum specimens, where they were kept. We look at historical documents, and we also extract their DNA. We have to use all these information to put the identity of the anatomy together because we cannot just use one. If we just use DNA alone, DNA is not strong enough, it's not powerful enough to tell us what they look like. If we use the museum specimens alone, they don't tell us anything about how the real anatomy looks like. So we have to use all this information to find out how the animal looks like. It's like being a detective. Now, again, I repeat, in order to protect things, the first step to wisdom is to know their things themselves. How can we protect our shores if we do not know what we have? All right. And with that, I end the talk. And now we can go for the Q&A. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you, Kieran, Evans, Justin, and Siobhan for answering and sharing what you know, especially all of you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. thank you so much, Nicholas, and thank you once again to the four young panelists. I've learned so much from just hearing you guys talk. But before that, um, we still have a little bit to go where we have some very interesting questions. Yes, so our first question is from Evans, and he asks, when the boxer crab holds sea anemones, does the sea anemone feel pain? Ooh, very interesting question. Nicholas, what do you think? No, I, the sea anemone doesn't feel pain at all. Uh, don't forget, the shell of the boxer crab is quite thick. And probably where it holds, the stings are not strong enough to pierce through the shell. So the boxer crab will hold it, and it, when, it, when it feels dangerous, it will just punch like that. Like how a cheerleader has a pom-pom to go towards its, its attacker so it can protect itself. Oh. All right, I hope that answers your question. So it does not feel pain. Yes, that's right. All right, so we have a second question from Yucha. And she asks, uh, how do they live so long? And how do they connect and split? Well, that's, that's an interesting one. Uh, we are still trying to discover how they can live so long so that we can live long too. But maybe, and this gets a bit, difficult to understand, but maybe they don't experience time the way we do. Every day we feel like, you know, we go through time in 24 hours a day, but maybe for them, they experience time in a really, really different way. I can't tell. I'm not a CNM. -y. So maybe 100 years or more for them is actually a very, very short period of time. How they split up, it has to do with cellular processes and chemicals within them. Uh, it's a bit too deep to delve into for a talk like that. But if you, if you want more, you can email me. Uh, Dana and the rest can give you my contact, okay? Any more questions? Yes, we do have one more question oh. from me. Uh, not from me, but someone has sent it in. Um, and it's a very interesting question. So uh, this person asked, what exactly do does taxonomist uh what what exactly is a taxonomist? And because there are not so many specialized scientists nowadays, uh this person is really curious as to what your job entails. Well, uh sorry, that's that's quite a bit of feed. Can you hear that? Yes, I can hear. Yeah, sorry, it's it's just hang on. Okay, so so a taxonomist is a person that classifies uh, animals, that identifies animals, or even, even plants, sorry, not just animals alone. They, a taxonomist is a person that identifies and classifies all living entities so that it'd be easier to work on them. Because let's say if you want to work on, on a certain living organism, you need to know what it is before you can work on it. Am I right? Okay. So that's what a taxonomist does. Uh, but because how you classify and identify things is really based on what information you have on hand. 
So sometimes some of the identification might not be correct and we don't discover that until 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road. So a taxonomist does this by checking to make sure that what is identified is correct and, um, and you know, publish our findings, publish our findings in scientific journals. Uh, but these days, uh, because taxonomy is, you're quite right, it's quite a specialized niche. Um, not many people do it. And if we do do it on the site, it's only a small little project on the site. Uh, for the rest of the time, we are spending on bigger projects like e ecological monitoring projects, uh, climate change experiments. So the most recent one that, that, that we are trying to do is to see if jellyfish do bloom as the sea temperatures rise. You keep hearing about that, but in truth, there's very little evidence to support that. So we're trying to find that out. And we're trying to find many different things. We get involved in different things, but taxonomy is always important. And if we have time, we'll still do it. I'm trained, trained as a taxonomist, but you know, at the end of the day, we all have to survive and end of the living. That's it, yeah, thank you. So that's a quick follow-up question. Um, are there many taxonomists in Singapore? I think, I think it depends on, it really depends on which group you're looking at. Um, I believe that there are many crab, crustacean crab taxonomists in Singapore, uh, but worldwide for sea anemones, uh, there's very little of us. In fact, um, the person that trained me, uh, Dr. Daphne Fulton, she's the world's expert on sea anemones, just passed away this year, which is, which is really sad. So I think throughout the world, there's only like one, two, three, four, about, about seven CNM taxonomists left throughout the world. We need more. Otherwise we, we'd be doing so much work. So we need your help, right? And once we can identify the CNMEs along our shores, we can then learn how to better manage and conserve our shores. If we don't have the information, how can we even protect what we have? Yeah, that's it. Thank you so much, thank Nicola, you. for this very informative and enlightening session. And we'd sorry. like to thank you. Sorry. Sorry about the technical issues, though. Um, but thank you. It's been, it's been great fun. I thank the Nature Society for having me. And it's great fun with the four panelists, Kieran, Evan, Siobhan, and Justin. You guys are great, OK? Yes, yeah, so we really like to extend our thanks again, especially yeah. to our young panelists, as Nicholas has just said, uh, Kieran, Evans, Justin, and Siobhan. And thank you for coming and sharing so much about what you guys have found out about sea anemones. So I learned today that sea anemones can be found in icy cold water, and they're really important homes to animals as well. And even in such a small island such as Singapore, we have so many different types of anemones and we even have our own unique anemones as well. So we hope that everyone has had a good experience. And if you enjoyed this session today, we hope that you will continue to support the Nature Society as well. So we do lots of things from nature conservation uh, as well as nature-based education outreach to the public. Um, we are also an NGO, so it runs mostly on volunteers. So if you do feel inclined to support our work, uh, we invite you to join us as members, and we also welcome donations of any amount. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Yes, um, public support is really, really crucial in um, how uh, this organization works. So we really appreciate it. And also, if you guys want to volunteer, please do join us at some point as well. Next slide. Yeah, so um, all your donations would definitely be helping to fund these type of environmental programs and also to strengthen conservation in Singapore in general. Next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so you can also find us on social media channels on Facebook, Instagram, our website as well. And uh, of course, uh, after COVID and everything is all right, uh, we look forward to meeting you in person at our nature activities. So uh, once again, we'd like to express our gratitude to our young panelists, Kieran, Evans, Justin, and Nicholas, as well as Nicholas, our moderator, for sharing their knowledge with us today. 
And we've now come to the end of the session. So on behalf of all the speakers and everyone from the NSS Marine Conservation Group, we thank you and hope that you enjoy the rest of the, uh, of the day. So our next session will be at 11 a.m. tomorrow and we'll be talking about a really, really interesting creature, giant clams. Yes, so hope to see you there as well and hope you have a good day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Stay on the rest. Yes, the rest you can take your leave. Uh, do Thank you. Tomorrow. Bye bye.